Welcome to Murphy's Law and Whitetails, your guide to North America's number one big game animal. Today's topic is one of my all-time favorites and a subject on which I've probably received more questions from hunters over my career than any other. That is, the reasons for abnormal or non-typical antlers in whitetail deer. You know, you don't have to watch outdoor television long before you hear some hunter harvest a buck for quote, genetic improvement purposes. Had to get that cull out of our deer herd so he didn't pass on his genes to other deer. Well, to the trained eye, it's pretty easy to see that in many cases, that's just a young animal or the antler abnormality for which it was killed wasn't even genetically based. Therefore, that hunter had zero chance of improving genetics by removing that animal. While genetics can play a role, there are many other causes of antler abnormalities, in fact, most of which are more common than genetics. Perhaps the most common of these is injury. Injury to the skull or pedicle region or injury to the growing antler itself. When you talk about pedicle injuries, I'm referring to the pedicle or stump from which the antler grows. That can be damaged during antler casting or fighting, or perhaps even due to a brain abscess weakening that tissue. And once that pedicle is damaged, typically will produce an abnormal antler and that will be a permanent injury throughout life. You talk about velvet antler injuries. These are perhaps the most common of all types of antler abnormalities. I like to separate early velvet antler injuries from those later in the growth period because those that occur early on can produce much more profound outcomes than those obviously towards the end of a buck's velvet growth period. Here's a good example of a buck that damaged its antlers during the first few weeks of the antler growth period. This was a three and a half year old buck at the University of Georgia, one of my research deer. And as you can see, at three and a half years of age, it produced a very average set of antlers for a three-year-old. In fact, most hunters would have harvested this buck, patted themselves on the back because they got a genetically inferior deer out of their deer herd. That same deer, one year later, at four and a half, produced a perfectly symmetrical 140-inch set of antlers. Again, hunters would have been making a big mistake by harvesting that deer at three and a half. When you talk about later stage velvet antler injuries, I've got an example of a very old buck, a 10 year old buck, also at the University of Georgia that broke its main beam in a kickboxing match with another buck. It obviously repaired that, but it produced a couple of little kickers, but nothing overly profound because it was a late season, late velvet injury. Disease and other things can also cause antler abnormalities. I mentioned the possibility of brain abscess. Uh, this was a severe case, obviously removed the entire pedicle. This buck died shortly thereafter. However, hemorrhagic disease is also a possibility. And in mule deer, researchers have linked the condition known as cactus antlers, those in velvet with multiple points that are never shed, due to testosterone deficiencies caused by hemorrhagic disease. Has yet to be documented to any extent in whitetails, but certainly could be a possibility. Another common cause of antler abnormality is a leg injury. And many hunters are aware that if a deer is severely injured on the front or rear leg, it can cause an antler deformity. But what's interesting here is that we see a different effect based on the front or rear leg. If it's a rear leg, we see what we call a contralateral deformity. In other words, an opposite antler effect. This is a good example of a buck I harvested several years ago that had a very abnormal antler on one side and opposite back leg, it was missing nine inches of its rear leg. Very clearly to see what caused this antler abnormality. And this is a permanent uh, injury as well. So once you see a buck with a severe leg injury, particularly a rear leg and an opposite antler, you can pretty well count that that will continue in future years. What's interesting here though, is we see a different effect on front leg injuries. Typically we see the same side antler showing the deformity and sometimes both. So again, a very different outcome based on a rear leg or a front leg. Genetics also can play a role, obviously, if you have a highly symmetrical non-typical set of antlers and or things like drop tines. Those are primarily genetic traits and certainly genetics can play a role here. But one last cause that many hunters are unaware of is age. Believe it or not, over 50% of all bucks, if allowed to live long enough, will express some non-typical traits. Reference this old buck earlier, this was a 10 year old buck and didn't show any of these abnormal points until about age eight, but from age eight on, started to throw a lot of non-typical characteristics. So the take home message here is that while genetics can play a role, Many, many other factors can cause abnormal antlers in whitetail deer. My personal advice is the strategy I use where I hunt. And that is I wanna see at least two years of expression of an abnormal antler trait before I consider harvesting an animal, unless I can clearly see the reason, like a damaged leg. So if I see a trail cam photo of a buck for the first time and it has an antler abnormality, unless I know why, I give that buck at least one more year before I put him on the hit list. And again, the hit list, probably not for genetic reasons, but because that buck simply will not produce a set of antlers that will meet our management objectives on our property. That's it for today's episode of Murphy's Law. 
hope you learned something. Until next time, be sure to leave your questions and your comments here in the video, but also to subscribe to our YouTube channel and to check out all the great content at HuntStand.com.